Hello, and welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Today we look at the case of Charles Riddington, who was found guilty of the murder of George Barker. We also look into the appeal that Mr. Riddington has made, and on what grounds he has appealed on. And finally, we will look into what the appeal courts had to say on the matter. George Barker was having a good week. His partner had recently given birth and he was on his way to the gym. However, he had no idea that Charles Riddington, who was 37 at the time, lay in wait for his arrival behind the front door of the Double K Gym, which is in Blexley, South East London, whilst he was wearing goalkeeper gloves with his hood up. Once Mr. Barker got inside the gym, Mr. Riddington then proceeded to stab the 24-year-old Mr. Barker 17 times in front of many horrified gym users, inflicting a wound through his cheek that was struck with such a severe force it had knocked out his tooth. The gym where the attack took place is run by Kieran Kettle, who is a well-known personal trainer and who had trained a very well-known UK actor, Idris Elba, in preparation for a professional fight he was taking part in in Thailand a month before the killing. Mr. Riddington, who had once claimed he was a friend of the ex-England star Jamie Redknapp, had fled the country on a false passport and then went on a run to South Africa, jetting to Cyprus twice to see his wife and two children. However, on one of his trips to Cyprus, he was caught and extradited back to Britain in 2018. The court had heard how Mr. Riddington was involved in the importation and supply of cocaine in the southeast of London, and it was in dispute with Mr. Barker over a £20,000 drugs debt. When Mr. Riddington had turned up to the gym on the 14th of November 2016 with three other men, the group took control of the gym and told other gym users to stay where they were as an ambush was about to take place. Mr. Riddington had been asking the gym users what time the victim usually turned up and one witness said how he laid in wait for him behind the door. Jonathan Rees, who was prosecuting, said that Mr. Riddington took out the knife to teach him a lesson and butchered that young boy. Mr. Riddington, who claimed he had acted in self-defence but was convicted of murder by a jury at the Old Bailey. However, he was cleared of possession of an offensive weapon following a two-week trial. Mr. Riddington has had many previous convictions for offences of dishonesty and, when he was much younger, had served a 30-month sentence in the Young Offenders Centre for conspiracy to steal. When the police searched Mr. Riddington's home, they found a CS gas canister and a stun gun. Mr. Riddington had accepted the charge of possessing them in the court. Mr. Riddington's wife was very upset in the public gallery as she watched her husband be jailed for life with a minimum of 19 years and said he didn't even have a knife as she watched Mr. Riddington be led away to the cells. Judge Nigel Lickley QC told Mr. Riddington the wounds suffered by George Barker were horrific and you aimed a knife at his face and body cutting and slashing him, causing him deep and severe wounds. George Barker knew he had been injured because he asked for an ambulance. He was able to walk to the end of the gym where he had collapsed. You then began planning your getaway, disposing of the clothes and the knife. Judge Lickley also added, The distress and damage you have caused will continue to affect people for many years to come, if not throughout their entire lives. The judge said that Mr. Riddington had planned the murder and was clearly associated with the three other men who were at the gym. Mr. Barker was killed in a vicious attack and suffered dreadful injuries. You chose to use that weapon and you did so with devastating effects. I reject any suggestion that you were acting in self-defense or lost control when you said you used that knife. One of the witnesses who was there, Carol Cox, told the court how she had gone to the loo at the back of the gym before her scheduled training session was about to begin. She told police how she had barricaded herself inside the toilet after hearing raid voices and banging on the door. Miss Cox described seeing splashes of blood coming from under the toilet door after Mr. Riddington drove Mr. Barker right across the gym from the entrance. 
leaving a trail of blood behind them as the attack continued. Mr. Riddington kept swinging at him and Mr. Barker was screaming at him to stop before he pulled out the lock knife and plunged it into Mr. Barker's head and body. A champion kickboxer who was present at the crime had failed to turn up to the court and give evidence after witnessing the grisly murder. Luke Skywalker Wellen, who was 28 at the time, explained how he had went into fright mode after seeing the killing of George Barker at the Double K gym. Ahead of the trial, Mr. Wellen had received repeated contact from the victim's family which triggered a perceived fear for his safety, the court had heard. Shortly before he was expected at court, Mr. Wellen had left his bank cards and his phone at his mother's house and was dropped off by his girlfriend at the King's Cross station. Despite a warrant for his arrest, Mr. Wellen had disappeared for three weeks, only resurfacing after the trial had finished. Early the following morning, Mr. Riddington had boarded a flight from Manchester to Dusseldorf using a false passport which was under the name of Barry Ryan. Mr. Riddington had told the jurors that he spent the day before the stabbing at Sky Sport pundit Jamie Redknapp's house. The pair both had children who played for Chelsea's youth team and had been celebrating Mr. Redknapp's son's 8th birthday. Mr. Riddington said that the three men had approached him outside the gym a week before saying that Mr. Barker had told them he was unable to pay a £20,000 coke and skunk debt because Mr. Riddington owed Mr. Barker money. Mr. Riddington was very upset in the witness box as he recalled how the brawl seemed to go on forever, telling jurors he just wanted to get the knife off of him. He told the jury, I was so scared for my life. I was fighting for my life. In an impact statement by the victim's mother, Julie Underwood, she said that the gruesome torture and the details of which were heard in the court will be forever embedded in our minds forever. Mr. Barker, who also had two sisters, was described as cheeky and funny and always smiling. Mrs. Underwood said that her son's cap is still in the kitchen where he always left it. His trainers are in the hall and his clothes are still in his wardrobe in a home where his family still lights a candle for him every night. The last time we saw George, was on a mortuary slab. This was the worst moment of our lives, Mrs Underwood added. Mr Barker's father, Tony Barker, who was being treated in hospital for a life-threatening condition when his son had died. He last saw his son in his hospital bed and he said they shook hands and put their previous difficulties behind them. We were set for a new future, a harmonious one. If I survived and came out of hospital, it was all going to be different this time, he said in his impact statement. I managed to get out of hospital. What a terrible tragedy that he didn't. Mr. Riddington, who was from Orpington, Kent, denied that he was guilty of murder, but he was convicted by the jury. However, he was cleared of possessing an offensive weapon. He smiled at his friends and family in the public gallery as he was led away. However, recently, Mr. Riddington has applied to appeal his conviction and he has had his case heard before the Court of Appeal. Why did Mr. Riddington appeal his sentence, and on what grounds does he plan to appeal? On the 17th of October 2019, at the Central Criminal Court, Mr. Riddington was convicted unanimously of the offence of murder. He was sentenced by Judge Lickley QC to a sentence of life imprisonment. The minimum term was specified as 19 years less 28 days for which he had been spent in custody in a foreign jurisdiction awaiting extradition and 342 days which were spent on remand in the UK. Mr Riddington was acquitted on count two which was an allegation of possession of an offensive weapon. He had earlier on the 19th of August 2019 pleaded guilty to counts three and four each of which was a charge of possession of a prohibited weapon contrary to the section of 5.1b, which is of the Firearms Act of 1968. On each of those counts, the judge imposed a sentence of three months, which was made concurrent both to each other and to the main sentence. These are the facts which were laid out to the appeal court. On the 14th of November 2016, Mr Barker in total sustained 17 injuries, three of which, the wounds to the torso, were fatal. Mr. Riddington and Mr. Barker knew each other 
and it would appear there had been a dis dispute between them both apparently over money. Mr. Riddington arrived at the gym before Mr. Barker that morning but did not start training. He was wearing goalkeeper's gloves. Mr. Barker arrived at the gym at 9.20 a.m. and within minutes, Mr. Riddington was seen to punch him in the face. As the two men struggled, one of them produced a lock knife. Mr. Riddington took the knife and stabbed Mr. Barker numerous times about the face and body. Mr. Barker stumbled towards the front of the gym where he collapsed. The owner of the gym, Kieran Kettle, called the emergency services, but despite the best efforts of the paramedics, Mr. Barker was pronounced dead at 10.44. Following the incident, Mr. Riddington disposed of the knife and bloodstained clothing, and the next day fled the country using a false passport. Initially, he flew to Germany and spent some time in South Africa. He was eventually arrested in Cyprus on a European arrest warrant and extradited on the 8th of November 2019. Mr. Riddington was arrested and charged on the 9th of November 2019, but was not interviewed by the police. Mr. Riddington's home address was searched and the police found a stun gun and a CS canister. Those were both subjects to count three and four. At the trial, the prosecution's principal case was that Mr. Rinton had bought a lock knife with him to the gym on the 14th of November 2016 in order to reap revenge. He had waited behind the door and ambushed Mr. Barker in a short, furious attack. The number and the extent of the wounds indicated that he was the aggressor. He had gone there with the intent for murder and at no stage did he lose self-control. To prove the case against Mr. Rinton, the prosecution relied on the following strands of evidence. First, evidence from Mr. Kettle was read. He was the owner of the gym. He became aware of a tussle between Mr. Riddington and Mr. Barker, and Mr. Riddington saying to Mr. Barker that he owed him some money. He asked the men who were with Mr. Riddington to try and pull him away. They tried to do so, screaming, Stop, stop, that's too much. He thought that Mr. Riddington was just throwing punches, but he could see that Mr. Barker was bleeding and holding the side of his body. He then saw that Mr. Riddington was holding a knife. The incident only lasted about 10 seconds or so, and Mr. Riddington left with the same group of men. Mr. Barker came forward to Mr. Kettle and collapsed. The second piece of evidence that the prosecution relied on was from Luke Wellen, a personal trainer. He did not attend the court as we explained earlier, but his statement was read to the jury. Mr. Wellen explained that he knew Mr. Barker and was not aware of any trouble. Mr. Wellen explained that he saw five white men walking into the gym and knew that something dodgy was about to happen. They were wearing gloves and had their hoods up. Not one of them said anything. The first man went straight behind the door Minutes later, Mr. Barker walked in and the first man punched him straight away. Mr. Barker was pleading with him saying, what have I done? The man said, you owe me money and you've gone behind my back. He then saw the same man pull out a knife and plunge it into Mr. Barker's head. When Mr. Wellen spoke up, he was told to sit the fuck down. It appeared to Mr. Wellen that Mr. Barker did not want to fight and held his arms out indicating this. The third piece of evidence that the prosecution relied on was evidence from Charles Peters, another personal trainer who was in the gym. Mr. Peters became aware of a commotion and noticed a group of men swarming around Mr. Barker, preventing him from getting to the door. Mr. Peters said he heard Mr. Riddington accusing him and Mr. Barker saying, no, it wasn't me. Mr. Peters jumped out of the way and ran towards the front door. He did not see any punches or any weapons being used. The fourth piece of evidence that the prosecution relied on was from Carol Cox, who was also at the gym that morning to train. She had went into hiding in a toilet at the relevant time and did not see the incident. There was also expert evidence from the pathologist, Dr. Chapman, who had conducted a post-mortem. He identified 17 knife wounds on the head, body and arms of Mr. Barker. There was a mixture of slashing type wounds and stab wounds. 
There were multiple slash wounds to the left side of the head and neck, and one of them to the left cheek, which had severed the roots of the upper molar. There was a cluster of three deep stab wounds to the left side of the back. These were the fatal injuries and associated with the two areas of stab damage to the lower lobe and the left lung and spleen. The grouping of these injuries suggested a rapid infliction with very little movement between Mr. Barker and Mr. Riddington. Dr. Chapman agreed that it was possible that some injuries could have been caused as a result of tussling over the knife. He also agreed that the injury to the right arm could have been a defensive action. At the trial, the defense's case was that Mr. Riddington had been acting in self-defense during the fight. Mr. Riddington gave evidence at trial. He had known Mr. Barker for a number of years and they both trained at a number of gyms. Mr. Riddington explained that Mr. Barker had owed some men around £20,000 in respect of a drugs debt. He had gone to the gym to train and had a confrontation there with Mr. Barker about the fact that he alleged that he was owed money by himself. Mr. Riddington explains that Mr. Barker then punched him, and then Mr. Riddington then punched him back. The struggle continued, and Mr. Barker then pulled out a knife from his shorts. Mr. Riddington then managed to disarm him, and the two began to grapple for possession of the knife. During the fight, he accepted that he had stabbed Mr. Barker three times to the left side intending to cause really serious bodily harm. The defence say he might have lost his control as a result of the attack on him. When Mr Riddington had heard that Mr Barker had died, he decided to flee to Germany and then to South Africa, where some of his family had lived. The main issue for the jury was whether they were sure that Mr Riddington had not acted in self-defence. This would have been a complete defence to the charge of murder. There was also an issue in the alternative, whether Mr. Riddington had the partial defence of loss of control, which would have reduced the offence from one of murder to a manslaughter. Before the court considered Mr. Riddington's grounds of appeal, they said that it was important to note what the judge had said in his summing up. The judge gave the second part of the summing up, having earlier given legal directions in part one in which he summarised the evidence that the jury had heard at the trial. This was given on the 2nd of September 2019. It is important to see how the issues were framed for the jury to consider. The summing up of the evidence of the pathologist Dr Chapman. Mr Barker has 17 sharp injuries, including three which proved to be fatal. In contrast, Mr. Riddington's evidence was that he had suffered no injuries in the struggle and, in particular, had suffered no injuries to his face, arms or body from the knife, although he had some bruises. The original grounds for appeal were as followed. There were two grounds of appeal. First, the route to verdict document was equivocal to the steps to be taken before reaching a verdict of guilty of murder. Secondly, the judge erred in admitting to direct the jury as interpretation of the phrase, considered desire for revenge. That of course is an issue in the context of the partial defence of loss of control. Those grounds are not now in fact pursued by Mr Pono QC, who has appeared at this hearing with Mr Milner on behalf of Mr Riddington. We can therefore deal with them briefly because in our view, the points were, in any event, unarguable. In relation to the first ground, first, we note that the judge correctly directed the jury that they must consider each count separately as to their verdicts, and that their verdicts needed to be in the same two counts. In particular, the judge directed the jury that it was open to them to acquit on count two, but convict on count one, depending on the view they took on the facts. In the end, that is exactly what the jury did. There was nothing illogical about that. Furthermore, this outcome was consistent with the way in which the issues had been framed and in which the way Mr. Rinton himself had given evidence. It was common ground that whoever had brought the knife to the gym, there came a point in time where Mr. Riddington had held the knife. 
he had used that knife to inflict at least some of the injuries which took place and that he did so with the intention of causing really serious bodily harm. The main issue for the jury was therefore to decide whether he has done so reasonably in self-defence. The other issue for the jury was to decide whether he had partial defence for loss of control. There was therefore no necessary overlap between the issues which arose under the two counts. Under the original ground two, Mr. Ponell submitted that the phrase considered desire for revenge needed further definition in order to assist the jury. We consider that this argument was also unarguable and has rightly been abandoned. First, the phrase considered desire for revenge comprises plain words of English language and does not require no elaboration. If anything, elaboration might simply have served to confuse the jury. Secondly, we note that the direction which the judge gave corresponds exactly with the relevant passage in the model direction suggested by the Crown Court Compendium, at paragraph 35 in particular. This is a point which Mr. Ponwell expressly accepted in withdrawing this ground at the hearing before us today. In a document called Perfected Grounds of Appeal, dated 6th of December 2019, Mr. Riddington made some observations in response to the first of the respondents' notices. He also took the opportunity to add further ground for appeal relating to directions of loss of control. In essence, Mr. Ponnell now submits that there was ample evidence to show loss of control going back to the events which led up to the day before the incident and in his opinion the event did not occur in a flash. The difficulty with this submission is that Mr. Riddington's own evidence at the trial was that he may have lost control in a flash. Mr. Ponnell also fairly concedes that he did not raise his matter with the judge during the trial, even after a note had been passed from the jury, which he now submits, raised the issue and made it such as to require further elaboration from the trial judge on this element of the potential partial defence of loss of control. We do not accept that this is an arguable ground for an appeal. Since the refusal of leave on papers by a single judge, Mr. Ponell has added further grounds for appeal. In support of that new ground, he also makes an application under Section 23 of the Criminal Appeal Act of 1968 to adduce fresh evidence, namely a witness statement by Luke Welland dated 17th of September 2020. In that content, Mr. Ponell relies on the decision of this court in the case of Ishtak Ahmed to the effect that this court must reach its own assessment of evidence and then decide what effect it had on the safety of the conviction. At the trial, the evidence of Mr. Wellen, as we have said, was presented to the jury as being read. This was because he was unwilling to give evidence and had disappeared. An appropriate warning was given to the jury about the need for caution in treating this evidence because he was not present before them to be cross-examined. In his summing up, the judge summarised that the evidence of Mr. Wellen during his submissions. Mr. Ponnell now submits that the new evidence of Mr. Wellen gives a rise for a potential ground of appeal because it's subsequently different from the evidence read out to the jury at trial. The details of those suggested differences has emphasised in particular that Mr. Wellen now says that he does not know whether Mr. Riddington produced a knife and he did not actually see the stabbing. We do not consider that this evidence, even if it were admitted, would have any material impact on the safety of the conviction. First, as we have noted earlier already, the jury acquitted Mr. Riddington on count two. It was not necessary for the jury to be sure that Mr. Riddington had first produced the knife before they could convict him of murder. Furthermore, as we have noted earlier, Mr. Riddington himself accepted that there came a point in time when he had the knife and that he did inflict some of the injuries on Mr. Barker and that he did so with the intention of causing serious bodily harm. In those circumstances, the main issue for the jury was whether they were sure Mr. Riddington was not acting in reasonable self-defence. Another issue for the jury 
was whether Mr. Riddington had the partial defence of loss of control. Mr. Welland's evidence was not crucial to their determination of those issues. In this context, we bear in mind the evidence of Dr. Chapman, both as a number of injuries and the degree of force which would have been required to inflict three injuries which proved to be fatal. We also bear in mind that Mr. Riddington himself said that he had suffered no injuries from the knife, although his case was that there was a struggle after Mr. Barker had produced the knife. Finally, it should be noted that Mr. Riddington gave evidence in his own behalf at the trial and said he had not acted in self-defence. The fact of the matter is that the jury did not believe him. At an oral hearing before the appeal courts, Mr. Ponnell has elaborated a still further new ground of appeal, although he fairly acknowledges that he has not been so far formulated in writing. We say straight away that this is not an appropriate way to conduct appeals before this court or applications leave for him to bring an appeal. There have been many opportunities in this case, in numerous documents to which we have already referred to formulate with precision the proposed grounds for further grounds of appeal. This is important for the court to be able to do justice, not only to Mr. Riddington, but also to the prosecution and for the public's interest. With all that being said, we propose to deal with the merits of a further new ground which has been outlined before us today, only in oral submissions. In essence, Mr. Ponell submits that there is now expert evidence before the court which, particularly taken with the new evidence of Mr. Welland himself, to which we have already referred, give rise to a new potential ground of appeal, that he was suffering from PTSD at all times, to the extent that it is arguable that his evidence ought not to have been read to the jury at all. The note is dated the 13th of April 2021, and our attention has been drawn particularly to what has been submitted in paragraph 2. That is a reference to a report prepared by Professor Hacker Hughes on the 20th of December 2019, following a client interview on 4th of December 2019. Mr. Ponell relies in particular in what is said at page 6 of that report. We will quote paragraphs 54 and 55. Paragraph 54 states, He has an inability to recall important aspects of the trauma. In paragraph 55 it says, Mr. Wellen told me that he could only recall the important bits of the episode, with many aspects not being remembered, and recall only being possible with some effort. This continues currently. With respect to Mr. Ponell, we do not consider that this evidence can possibly give rise to any new ground of appeal, casting doubt on evidence that was read to the jury by Mr. Wellen at all. To the contrary, what the evidence of Professor Hacker Hughes highlights is that Mr. Wellen was able to recall the important bits of the episode. In those circumstances, we have come to the conclusion that none of the grounds of appeal which were proposed in this application are reasonably arguable. Accordingly, the application to appeal against this conviction is refused. Lord Justice Singh, who was at the hearing, had this to say. This is a renewed application for leave of appeal against the sentence. The background facts have already been set out in the judgment of the court given earlier today in refusing the renewed application for a leave to appeal against the conviction. In passing sentence, the judge said he would do so on the basis of findings of facts which he had made according to the criminal standard of proof. He said that the wounds suffered by Mr. Barker were horrendous. Mr. Riddington had aimed the knife at his face and body, cutting and slashing him, causing severe and deep wounds. The judge expressly directed himself that he could not find that Mr. Riddington had the knife with him when he went to the gym and did so with the intent to cause serious bodily harm. This was in the light of the jury's acquittal of count two. However, he went on to say that it was clear that Mr. Riddington had waited for Mr. Barker to arrive and had provoked a confrontation with him. The judge said he could also be sure that at some point in the incident,
Mr. Riddington was in possession of a knife and used it as a weapon to inflict the wounds that led to Mr. Barker's death. In order to do that, Mr. Riddington had pursued Mr. Barker at the rear of the gym where he became trapped. The judge also found that there was an element of planning in this case, that Mr. Riddington had made inquiries of where Mr. Barker may arrive at the gym. Mr. Riddington did not start a training session that day, but had waited 30 minutes for the other men and for Mr. Barker to arrive. In setting the minimum term for the offence of murder, the judge noted that both parties agreed that the starting point was 15 years, which was consistent to paragraph 6 of Schedule 21 to the Criminal Justice Act of 2003. The judge endorsed that agreed position. He then carefully went on to consider the aggravating factors, both statutory and other. The judge accepted that he was not a planned murderer with a knife, although there was some element of planning. There was also the use of a knife and the reason for the offence had been a dispute between those involved in the drug trade. There was then the factor of the concealment of evidence since Mr. Riddington had disposed of both his clothes and importantly the knife itself. He accepted that they were bloodstained. Next, there was Mr. Riddington's departure from the UK early that next day. He then remained outside the UK for a number of years using a false identity. Finally, there was a location and timing of the offence. It was committed in front of other people who had to witness the attack and did their best to aid the dying Mr. Barker. The judge also carefully had to regard the migrating factors against both statutory and other. The judge found, as a fact, that Mr. Riddington had an intention to kill and not simply an intention to cause serious bodily harm. Therefore, the potential mitigating factor was not available to him. The judge also took into account the personal circumstances of Mr. Riddington, including the fact that he had a close bond with his two young children. The judge noted that Mr. Riddington did not have previous convictions for violence and that he expressed remorse when giving evidence for the death of Mr. Barker. For the avoidance of doubt, the judge rejected any suggestion that Mr. Riddington had been acting in self-defense or he had lost control when using the knife. As we have said in our earlier judgment, the judge fixed the minimum term to be served at 19 years, less the number of days spent on remand awaiting extradition. In renewing his application for leave to appeal against sentence, Mr. Ponal QC submits that the judge first failed to make factual decisions when he was required to do so for the benefit of Mr. Riddington. Secondly, he made factual decisions on the part of sentencing exercise that were wholly unjustified on the facts and appeared to ignore compelling mitigating circumstances that should have served substantially to reduce the minimum term imposed. Mr. Riddington could be forgiven for thinking that the judge did not agree with the verdict of the jury and strove to ignore the necessary and obvious implications of their verdict on count two. We reject the suggestion that the judge sentence on such a basis which was inconsistent with the verdict of the jury. Acquitting Mr. Riddington on count two, the judge was carefully loyal to that verdict. Otherwise, he would have started with a minimum term of 25 years rather than 15. You can see paragraph 5a of Schedule 21 of the 2003 Act. Furthermore, we have reached the clear conclusion that the judge, in particular, having presided over the trial and having heard all the evidence, was entitled to make the findings of fact which he did. In particular, he was entitled to reject any suggestion that this had been an act of self-defense or that the applicant had lost self-control during the incident. The judge was also entitled to find that there was an element of planning in the period leading up to the offense. The judge carefully took into account both the aggravating and mitigating features of the case. He was entitled to find that there had been an intention to kill rather than the intention to cause serious bodily harm. In his oral submissions before us today, Mr. Ponal has emphasised certain matters, first by reference to paragraph 9 of his perfected grounds of appeal, i.e. sentence, 
He submits that the judge wrongly declined to make the finding as to the prevalence of the weapon despite being encouraged in the course of the argument by the defence to do so. In assessing the factual basis and the merits of application, the court is left to guess as to the proper interpretation of the jury's verdict and the judge's view of the facts. It is submitted that remaining true to the jury's verdict no judge could have been sure that the, that the applicant had brought a knife with him to the gym. We do not accept that submission. As we have already said, the judge was careful to be faithful to the verdicts of the jury, in particular the acquittal of count two. That is precisely why he declined to make a finding, for example, that after all, it had been Mr. Riddington who brought the knife to the gym. He was not required to do so. If anything, this was a feature of the case which fell to the benefit of Mr. Riddington rather than being an adverse to him. Another aspect that Mr. Ponell has emphasised in his oral submissions is that the judge did not mention that the absence of premeditation is a statutory mitigating factor under paragraph 11 of Schedule 21 of the 2003 Act. Mr. Ponell fairly acknowledges that the judge did mention this in absence in noting that there was an absence of premeditation as a statutory aggravating factor. Reading the sentencing remarks fairly and as whole, we are unable to accept that there has been any merit to this argument. It is quite clear to us that the judge had this point well in mind. In all circumstances of this horrific case, the appeal courts do not think that it is reasonably arguable either that the sentence was wrong in principle or that the minimum term of 19 years was manifestly excessive. For those reasons, the renewed application for leave of appeal against the sentence is refused. What are your opinions on what happened to Mr Barker? What are your opinions on the sentence of 19 years in which Mr Riddington received? Do you think the sentence was too harsh? or not harsh enough? What about Mr Riddington's grounds of appeal? Do you believe that he lost control or that the judge had not listened to the jury when they accepted that he had not brought a knife to the incident? Please let us know in the comments below. Thank you for joining us today. If you like this true crime content, please don't forget to like and share. And if you're new to the channel, please don't forget to hit subscribe and press that bell button so you can join us on the next video. Thank you for joining us today. And until next time, stay safe.